Hello and welcome to 21 for 21, 21 lessons in sport media for the 21st century, a sport social network podcast. On this week's episode, we talk about vertical video, motorsport documentaries and how MotoGP has overtaken Formula One on Facebook. Welcome back to 21 for 21, the podcast bringing you 21 more lessons about sport and media in the 21st century. I'm Stuart, sports marketer, joined as always by Jamie, sports journalist. Jamie, glad to be back. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a, it's been a good while. A lot's happened since we last recorded an episode. The last episode was about the the first record attendance at the Camp Nou, I think. So that record was since for, of, of a women's football match, sorry. So that record was since broken and then of course they played the the Champions League final and and we got the Euros ahead and so a lot's happened since since we last recorded anything yeah, I mean, we were in the, the, in the in the final straight of the football season yeah we're now the still with of course the, the the Nations League at the time of recording the football season it seems never ending but there the will be there will be a break but no you're right it's, it's great seeing how well, things a are short continuing. break Short break. A short break true. because domestic leagues start again very early this year, thanks to the World Cup in Qatar over the, no, the winter break. No, of course, of course. That's uh, again, I'm sure a topic for a future podcast. I guess the the what media innovations there might be for for the World Cup and how how it might differ being a, a winter or winter in the Northern Hemisphere World Cup in terms of yeah your viewing habits. Will the I don't know the summer beer garden festival move into some sort of indoor Christmas market type type viewing or will will yeah i don't know the, the race for christmas number one push the world the world cup out the out of the way it would really be interested to see how that winter winter world cup affects with our usual habits of what we associate a, a major football tournament of, of being yeah absolutely and it's not i mean in qatar we'll get we'll get into it in, in more depth another day i'm sure but in qatar that they're what it's gmt plus three is the time zone yes so I they're kind so. of two hours ahead of central europe three hours ahead of uh of london so i think I mean, I don't know how hot it is there during those kind of winter months, which I know is why they've scheduled it there. But I don't think they'll be playing the matches too late in terms of audiences. So I'm interested to see how it's uh, it's going to pan out. Yeah, it's not not quite a Asian event like the Tokyo Olympics were, and it's definitely not on the American time zone either. So you're right, for European viewers, it's, it's favourable, favourable, um, just being those two or three hours ahead, like you say. So, no, it'll be really be interesting to see what... What happens there um so uh i'm sure we'll have plenty more <laughs> le- lessons about about the world cup and fifa and and football in general but uh, yeah we'll, uh, we'll get to that <laughs> yeah i'm sure we've got um plenty more to talk about but um so i wanted to focus this this week jamie on our our return on on motorsport and specifically co- uh, comparing mm-hmm. motor gp and formula one and how they're growing in different ways but also the same ways but first there's a story that caught your eye about a, a different type of is it motorsport? Uh, they're electric motors. So I think I think it just sort of comes under the radar of of motors. It's the e-scooter championship, which uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's a very new championship. I think it uh, launched this year. Yeah, and it's basically e by Yanos type uh, investment. Or? I uh, honestly I don't know a lot about it. I, I don't. I've not had time to research it in too much depth. But it's caught my eye. It's basically these electric scooters that are now populating what seems to be most major cities in the world that you can pay for on a, an app on your phone and ride around the place unless you actually buy your own. Um, and they're they're running them in in race competitions. They're trying to run it in the in the same sort of um, style as the Red Hook Criterium, which if you're a cycling fan, you will know as uh, know of, which is basically uh, it's, they, they take over kind of um, European cities. Oh, yeah, so like a, a, a tour, no, like a, a time trial type thing, so like a race through the city, city streets. I believe so. so it's, it's, yeah, and they're fixed, fixed gear bikes, mm-hmm. so it's not the same kind of, you know, like a Tour de France or you. But not the tactics. You know, climbs and yeah. sprints mm-hmm. and downhills, and it's it's you know shorter shorter circuits and city circuits, and so that's the idea of uh, e scooter, is that they go in kind of small city circuits. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I think there's sort of an entry where, where kind of people can get an opportunity to to qualify. You don't have to be necessarily the, the same riders week in, week out. Oh, that's a nice idea. So it can be yeah, a local who knows their streets, they can, they can enter and have, have their shot at the shot at the prize. 
I believe so. I believe so. Uh, like I say, I've not had a massive amount of time to uh, to research it. But what really caught my attention is that they're broadcasting it. So it's 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 a new sport targeted at younger mobile first generation of viewers, perhaps the sort of viewers that will hound their parents for an electric scooter to, to zip to school on. Um, and so they're broadcasting it in 916, which is basically like Instagram stories or TikTok. So rather than having the traditional horizontal uh, video like you see on your TV or your laptop or whatever, they're filming it in vertical, which I spoke to a friend of mine that works for MotoGP and we kind of decided that maybe it works because it's they're kind of elongated. You know, oh, you stand okay. on a scooter, yeah. you're so quite tall. Like they're not hunched over like exactly. a pack of, pack of cyclists. Exactly, exactly. Um, so maybe maybe it lends itself to to that kind of format. I don't know, but the idea is that it will work natively on your phone. Okay. So this um, so new, new 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 sporting series ends it completely by bypassing TV. So will it be streamed just on a TikTok or an Instagram and not even um, entering the, the the market in the marketplace for TV? Uh, I I think it's an adapted broadcast. I think that they've perhaps got. I don't know even if it's that uh, major to be televised. I'm oh, like okay. scanning the various things. Yeah. They've got access across um, their own OTT platform, social media, and various mobile platforms. I think so. The idea is it is absolutely mobile first rather than TV first, like your traditional sports. Yeah, and so getting back to sort of what this was maybe mean for for the future of video. So when you're at, at events and when, when in, in your job you're filming with a traditional camera, I mean, are people filming these on? On mobile phones, or they film on traditional cameras. Just have that have a 916 view. It's a, or it's, a, it's a very good question. Maybe they just turn their their cameras 90 degrees. Um, I would imagine that they're filming it on perhaps like I don't think you could film it on a phone. I think the nature of these events and the the yeah. distance you have to be at with the camera and following it. I think it would have to be like a traditional electronic news gathering camera or a, maybe a yeah. And so I would imagine that they're filming it in a usual aspect ratio, in the usual um, 16-9 aspect ratio, and then they they have some kind of crop mechanism um, that's applied in, in in real time. I would imagine. I can't. I, I struggle to believe that they're filming it on sideways cameras. <laughs> yeah, no, um, really. Yeah, interesting. There's not to see. there's not a great deal of information out there about it. I I, I have to admit, but it, the yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, with an e-scooter e championships, maybe even this gimmick this new yeah, story and this is called, called ri so you know, maybe it's getting it <clears throat> this is their defining factor or this usp that will get at the attention from all these other other motorsport series and, and newer sports i've i've just uh pulled up the article in front of me and it, it would seem that it's kind of a usual produ like production and they mm -hmm. they send the original six so it's like i suspected they, they send the original 69 video to their their broadcast facilities where they kind of add in the the black bars if you like ah, okay, got it. To, to kind of frame it as as six as nine sixteen. But happening in in real time though, so they're filming at sixty nine goes back to yeah, base which, and then go flips out at nine sixteen. Exactly, which out, without turning your camera sideways would have been impossible just a few years ago. Oh, well, putting those kind of graphics and and framing the the video in that kind of um. Fast way. I'd imagine there's an element of artificial intelligence in there as well for the framing of the video. I could be wrong. Uh, I wouldn't surprise me to, either. Uh, there's, there's, more, there's more research to be done here. We need to uh, to reach out to some people. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So if you're if you're listening from the e scooter World Championship, we <laughs> we we are are looking for guests for for Series Two or Twenty One for Twenty One. So to get in touch. But it's worth mentioning that it's something now that a lot of content producers do, um, whether it's Formula One or uh, football, rugby, cricket, a lot of them now will take the original horizontal video and crop it so that it works for a, a TikTok video. Or, and you can, you know, a lot of this editing software, you can kind of, if you imagine you've got like this horizontal, uh, the vertical frame within your horizontal video, you can move it as necessary. Um, so it's not like you have to pick a fixed spot on the on the frame. Um, okay, so it's like if you're filming a, a wide shot of a game, you can do it on the goal or the the corner exactly. for example okay and a lot a lot of cameras now are operating in in 4k and so mm -hmm. you can get you know you can crop in quite a lot without having any or very little distortion when you kind of output it in hd so um no it's quite cool that they're able to do this in real time and broadcast mm -hmm. it in this way 
maybe there's a future for a lot of sports that they do simultaneous broadcasts. You know, they do their their traditional um, 16-9 broadcast alongside a 9-16 broadcast for, for mobile first. Yeah, I mean, back to what we started talking talk about right in our first or second episode with um, the increase of football matches being shown live on TikTok. But it was the more right. niche uh, Burnley women, I believe, we, we, we spoke about. So, yeah, maybe for the yeah, the, the football games, you have the option, yeah, to stream on TikTok or watch it on Sky Sports as the traditional. So that sort of thing, I'm sure, and, we'll be seeing more of. And I'd suspect it's only a matter of time before uh, someone at Sony or Samsung comes out with a gimmicky TV that you can mount on your wall. And depending on the aspect ratio of your 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 video, it'll, it'll no, turn okay. automatically. <laughs> um, not that I'll be investing in one. My, my yeah. big argument against all of this is that my eyes are horizontally arranged. <laughs> and, and that's how I want to be watching my video. But maybe I'm just there. Yeah. Uh, I'm being a, a Luddite, maybe. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? I mean, we will, I'm sure, be coming, coming back to this topic uh, as and when it becomes more and more, more and more mainstream. Um, yeah, so speaking like I of, say, I think this will yeah. be the start of mm-hmm. this, a start of, of simultaneous broadcast now for, for mobile. Yeah. Maybe not first, but, you know, equal mm-hmm. priority to traditional yeah. screens. Good. I mean, the technology yeah, certainly certainly is there. Um, but uh, speaking of, you know, motorsport and things entering the mainstream, again, we touched about in in our first series, the popularity of Drive to Survive, that Netflix documentary, behind the scenes documentary on Formula One and how it contributed to an increasing popularity of of, of the sport. So we saw record TV attendances, record attendances at the uh, American Grand Prix or huge three or 400,000 people more than the previous year or something than before COVID attending these these events in, in Austin. Um, so yeah, as We've heard, I know you've mentioned your friends at MotoGP, so they launched a similar documentary on the rival streaming service Amazon, but that's not really caught the imagination as as much as Netflix and Drive to Survive did, Jamie. Is there any main underlying reasons for that? Yeah, it would seem not. I, I'm yet to kind of find any clear data um, backing it or not, but it would certainly seem that uh, the kind of empirical data and and community feedback has not been the greatest um, that that it could have been. So it's called it's called MotoGP Unlimited, and it was launched um, on Amazon Prime, like you said, and produced by a Spanish um, media company called Media Pro Studios, uh, who are involved in various things around the world. And the idea was that they give viewers behind the scenes access to, to the World Championship, very similar to sort of Drive to Survive, but in their own kind of format. The storytelling format is a little bit different. Um, Drive to Survive kind of picked a, almost a standalone story each week, whereas the MotoGP one kind of followed the the series. Um, or sorry, followed the championship throughout the series. Um, but again, it had the same appeal, I think. You know, it was filmed on sort of cinematic cameras with you get that nice kind of blurred background texture and mixed with uh, track footage and and it was nice and high paced in terms of bringing you kind of the action of uh, a motor to gp um but yeah no like you say it, it, the, the 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 kind of uptake for it wasn't the best personally i think there were various issues when they first launched they uh, launched with dubbing so obviously the riders come from all over the world and it was decided that they're best expressing themselves in their own language which i think is is fair and reasonable um but they launched it with a like a dub with what was i was trying to find some tweets earlier because people were very out, upset about it but basically awesome. they were saying it was it was it was like a, a monotone robot like <laughs> oh, okay, okay. and and it was it was distracting frankly yeah. it was just you know you're watching your favorite writer talking passionately about what it is he does and there's this monotone english dub over the top um that said, pre-release, people were very upset that it was going to be subtitled. I don't want to be reading. I want to be watching the series. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, when they announced it, the you know the issue again with Squid Game, and I was it's away from sport as well. There was a big debate over which one is the right way to use it, but the choice was there. So I would have thought having the choice would be would be the standard. So that was the issue. Dubbing. There wasn't a, there wasn't a choice when it first launched. You had to watch it with the dub. Um, so like I said, before it launched, people were complaining about subtitles. Um, um, basically, okay, what people wanted was that everyone spoke English, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you can't keep everyone happy, at least of all fans. Sorry. No. <laughs> um, and I think for me personally, from a journalistic point of view, I'd rather see 
the the protagonists of the show who are the writers Mm -hmm. speaking in their own words as fluently and as as passionately as you know they can express themselves as someone that spends a lot of his time speaking another language i i I can tell you i speak express myself much better in english than i can in spanish um so i think the same is you know the same is for these writers and whatever sports series i watch i'm perfectly happy to hear Mm -hmm. uh whoever it is talking in their own language and and having it subtitled um, I guess that might be a uh, a content issue then that you're right it's maybe um you, you can't can't please everyone with a what might seem like a small production issue but it's, it's proven to be a, a a big a big issue in amongst the fans uh do you think it could also be an issue just how how many sport documentaries there are is it, is it simply a market saturation or is, is there room for pretty much any sporting property to have, have a documentary Sure. So, uh, yes, is the honest answer. I think that the, the documentary, people have been talking about documentaries now for, uh, I'd say, a good part of a decade since streaming services kind of first came out. And a lot of these documentaries um, hit our screens and they were document, and now they're documentary about absolutely everything. Everyone's got a documentary. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think there are so many streaming services with so many documentaries that it's difficult to stand out. I think one of the big issues for MotoGP was that, and you did it earlier on in the show, you said we'll compare MotoGP to Formula One. And I think it's it's as a sport, but also people were expecting Drive to Survive. And Drive to Survive had its very unique way of telling its story, and it had a lot of success on Netflix. And this was never going to be the same, but that's fine, you know. Um, but I think people had their hopes set on something else, and it, it didn't live up to that. Um, so yeah, I think I think the honest answer is is yes, you're probably right. There are too many other documentary series vying for your attention, and if you don't get hooked on the the first episode, then you're going to struggle kind of sticking with it because there are so many other things trying to vie for your attention. Um, so yeah, and so I think a lot of people their initial experience was with this horrible dubbing, and they thought, ah, you know what, I'm not going to come back. <laughs> no, um, that's the interesting. I think, I think, though, I mean, it was maybe a, a lazy comparison between Formula One and, and MotoGP, but... It's easily I mean, done. They, a lot of people do yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, no, I think they... You you, you, you would have to compare. Um, so I think MotoGP or Formula One, they would see their rivals as, as each other, maybe the big major sports teams or, or sports leagues, but ultimately, um, yeah, they're similar. Um, this is the top premier racing series of cars and, and bikes. There are going to be a lot of similarities between them um but one thing i did find interesting this is um in, in the course of course of my job we did a sort of a brief link, linkedin post on this topic a couple of weeks ago and i found out that motor gp actually have more fans on facebook than formula one so the official motor gp channel as the formula one was on top overall but on on facebook i think it was 13 million motor gp to 10 million f1 or maybe oh, well wow. i wasn't yeah, so, aware of that yeah so i think that maybe shows again we can really go deep deep into this uh the data using our, our, our iris tools if anyone is interested is is listing but maybe that shows that the demographic is different because to be broadly stereotypical um facebook is maybe for, for the older generation whereas obviously streaming services are perhaps for the younger generation so maybe this most gp content went out in in the wrong place i i i, I think you you're probably very your your suspicions are uh, quite near to being correct, I'd imagine. I think the demographics are different. Um, I think the demographics have shifted a lot in the past couple of years due to the success of Drive to Survive uh, for Formula One. Um, it's interesting that you pointed that out because one of the things that uh, I don't know the, the kind of the Facebook consumption anymore. I can't remember the last time I logged onto Facebook, frankly. Um, but one of the big big markets for MotoGP, for example, is Indonesia. And may, maybe there's a greater uptake of users in, of Facebook in Indonesia or I don't know. But one of the things that MotoGP do, and, and I'm maybe a bit biased here, but I, I think they do very well, is they built communities on, Moto, on Facebook. So they've got like a tech gossip uh, Facebook group. And they've got a, I think they've got a memes group even that's like run by oh, the, official. the official MotoGP yeah. brand. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's within a group in Facebook and they've created that, that strong community. Okay. And I think that's something they've done really well. Uh, I think they've done that really, really well. And it, it's bought loyalty more than anything. Uh, it doesn't necessarily bring in new fans like a, a hit series on Netflix would. But I think it's it's given them a great deal of loyalty. And 
uh, yeah, and and keeping attention on MotoGP when there there are no race events, which is a bit again, different. That's, to, that's an, to an important on. thing, yeah. So maybe as you said, Formula One with um, Drive to Survive, it, it built that community in places like America based on the documentary. With MotoGP, already had the fan base, so maybe the documentary was it may be necessary because everyone's got a documentary they had to have one but maybe perhaps in yeah, not the best well, way or done the right way to get, to it's, get it's worth pointing out it's it's not the first kind of behind the scenes documentary that they've done okay. they've they've done various uh shorter documentaries that focus on maybe a specific thing so the uh sepang racing team who have had two pretty good seasons mm-hmm. well one very good season and one pretty good season um but they came out very kind of strong and they did uh, their first season they did a whole kind of behind the scenes of like setting up the team and and you know the backroom conversations of how they're going to manage this team and who they're going to sign and and which riders are going where and stuff and then they did a second sort of follow-up season um and that was quite successful that went out on their ott platform and on youtube they've also done um motor gps platform or the team's platform even motor gps MotoGPs. As far as I'm aware, none of the teams have got their. Yeah, own I would have been surprised platform. if they had. But I was just was wondering, just wanted to, yeah, maybe be it sure. Could, and, it could be. Yeah. It could well be a matter of time. Yeah, it wouldn't. You know, everyone seems to have a documentary, and once you put your documentary, you look at getting your own OTT platform. Um, I saw Tottenham Hotspurs are launching their OTT okay, platform okay. this summer. Everyone's got one these days. Yeah, <laughs> I think we should get ideas from. Uh, but yeah, so and and then MotoGP have also done um, sort of yearly feature length documentaries okay okay so, so the but again it's kind of in-house production hosted on their own um, yeah. ott or sold out to broadcasters or licensed out to broadcasters rather than this kind of dedicated series in this true documentary series format that that drives to survive was which is what they sort of tried to do i think with uh, motor gp unlimited was trying to kind of fill that gap yeah well, i mean maybe it is just again the first season i don't know if we, if we, if we know anything about um if it's future future efforts but i'm sure right the season would, one of drive to survive had a slightly different format from from the later seasons yeah maybe they'll most of will at least see some value and they can build build on this going going forward for future future years yeah it does seem that the uh from from what i gather from journalists reporting in the paddock that, that it's been put on hold the, okay, okay. The, the teams of people that were following them around with cameras and microphones have now sort of disappeared from the paddock um so it looks like we might not get one this season the future seasons i'd imagine that they'll be looking at doing something um but you have to remember as well this is a big investment for these these competitions of course uh, it's a big um compromise for the riders and the drivers and the teams who let's be honest on a race weekend their, their number one focus is winning the it race, is the race not, definitely not sitting down and recording interviews and worrying about you know being on tv and that's something that that has been reflected on by various formula one drivers that uh, you know they were kind of being dragged away from what their kind of primary job is or that they were becoming too intrusive or um you know that was kind of a a big issue for for a lot of the formula one drivers um i mean yeah i mean the thing is that is part of part of being an athlete in in any context context really so maybe if they aren't being dragged away by 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 Netflix, they want to be dragged away by their agent to record a an Instagram story or a or, or a TikTok themselves. So I think it is. Well, you have to, you have to imagine on a on a usual kind of race weekend. There's often like a pre-event press conference, uh, the or the race association, whether it's MotoGP, Formula One, mm-hmm. um, World Indoor Trial, whoever, will NASCAR will want to do their own kind of pre-event shoot, yep. which often is taking them to an iconic landmark nearby and doing something. Uh, their teams will want to do something. There'll be various media scrums. Uh, various broadcasters will probably have uh, petitions to do something as well. And and that'll be every day. So then add on top of that, this production company that are creating this documentary. That I mean, I think, um, well, I know Lewis Hamilton and, and Mercedes didn't take part in the, the last series, right? It was, yeah. Uh, drive to survive. Yeah, so you're right. There's always, there's always going to be some... Um, <clears throat> If it's not seen as part of your your strategy, or it's not, not not fitting your image. So yeah, but probably I think I saw Lewis yesterday. Lewis Hamilton, he's going to be producing a Formula One movie, either starring or, or with with Brad Pitt. So yeah, they've seen yeah. So that pop, popularity of a group thing is 
they've grown out of it almost or, already. I mean, that's the other side of it is that everyone now wants their own documentary too, <laughs> you know, as an individual and or mm-hmm. as an individual that's got an interesting story to tell. And it wouldn't surprise me if Lewis Hamilton has got his own documentary team working on the Lewis Hamilton documentary, um, yeah. for example. Mm-hmm. And and I, I, that's, you know, yet another media commitment for them. My cat's joined the conversation. Um, and I think that will happen if it's not already happening across a range of sports, that there'll be whatever football team or broadcaster or producer or production company shooting their documentary with the team. And then each member of the team will have their own yeah. company doing their individual documentary. And at the end of the season, we'll get 25 plus one documentary. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure there is. Uh, or even the champion, you know, the various championships. Yeah, I mean, there, there is now an appetite for that. You already see about how the top footballers or the top sports stars have more social media followers than, than the team. Yeah, and that that itself drives its own revenue and its own income streams and and its own interest from from fans and and everyone's looking to monetize everything and as much as they can, rightly so, understandably. Why wouldn't you? Um, yeah, it, it keeps us both in work in uh, in, in, in some, some way. And it keeps us entertained. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, we're going to sit down and watch it. So oh, definitely. Um, well, yeah, so, no, I'm, um, I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> no, in terms of. Um... Yeah, back to, back to our, our, our theme, so 21 lessons, so uh, round two, so this is lesson, we call it, we're calling it lesson 22 or le- lesson yeah. one again, it's a, a good question of <laughs> good question of languages, but um, yeah, is there anything from what we talked about, from the, the new camera techniques uh, involved in in the scooter to the, the, the choice of different broadcasters and different documentary formats, what, how would we sum this up as our, as our first lesson back? Well, maybe we could, uh, and I'm trying to think of how to phrase it as a lesson, but maybe we can make a prediction that in the next, let's say the next year, we're going to see uh, a vertical video documentary series. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, you yeah, know, so... it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if we, and I'm, I'm talking, okay, mobile first, so maybe they wouldn't be like 40-minute episodes. Maybe they'd be 12-minute episodes, because that's yeah, a, a nice monetizable before. length for, mm-hmm. for, I think TikTok allows up to 12 minutes now um and and youtube mobile first um and and yeah that yeah, wouldn't no, surprise think, me yeah no i'm again yeah we are we, we can't we're not we're not, we're not expert guests giving this lesson but no, from from what we, we've said and our educated educated guesses yeah i think yeah we're, we're, let's, let's turn back so for for episode one of of our third series of 21 for 21 in about a year's time let's see if that documentary <laughs> is in the works um and if you're a producer listening to this have you considered making your documentary mobile first and shooting it vertically turn your turn your camera on its side (laughs) uh, so jamie where where can we find us um we're at on on youtube it's 21 for 21 um we're on sports social network wherever you listen to your podcasts yeah do do be sure to to like and subscribe and we'll be back with you for for our next lesson very soon